Do you think I was making a deal with the Russians? That I'd actually kill someone? I guess I deal spin any kind of fiction to stain good cops bad. Back in the early 2000s, there was something big brewing on television. The Sopranos was a certified phenomenon on HBO, and it was changing ideas about what was possible on the small screen. TV dramas no longer had to be primetime procedurals, and clearly main characters didn't have to be heroes. Enter The Shield, FX's first original drama, debuting in 2002 and centered around crooked cops in Los Angeles. You're not a witness, and you're an arrest, and this shit is just enough to make you a trafficker. You can't do that, man. What, plus drug dealers? You just made my quota for the week. The show was a smash success, the highest rated basic cable debut to that point in history. Audiences were more than ready to dive into the show's Faustian bargain. Are the police worth it? While The Shield might be often overlooked in the run of anti-hero shows that followed, it captures a historical snapshot of America's relationship with the police, a paradox of a cop show. It both critiques and glorifies the police. It wants to explore society's relationship with the police and, in the process, ends up perpetuating the same discourse it wants to comment on. Welcome to Copaganda a series of videos exploring the portrayal of the police on television and how that portrayal has shaped our understanding of who the police are and what they should be. We've covered how the LAPD helped create the cop show genre by providing creative input and censorship on Dragnet. We've explored Blue Bloods, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and The Wire. Last time, we started talking about The Shield and how it takes aim at anti-gang units while also falling into familiar and false stereotypes. If you haven't seen part one, it's linked in the description. As a show about crooked cops, The Shield, of course, highlights corruption and police brutality. But on a more fundamental level, it's about society's contract with the police. That is, examining what we want the police to do, and the concessions we're willing to make to achieve that end. And if that's not relevant in 2020, after seeing police officers abuse their power against individuals like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, Jacob Blake, and against the people protesting that violence. I'm hitting people in the car. Did you hear me? I was like, get the f***. He's on. Oh, no, 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 I know. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, though, they were in front like, just like, didn't hit anybody. Then, I don't know what is. So let's get back to the shield. Can an anti-hero show audiences flaws in the police, or does it just turn into police porn? Heads up, The Shield is a darker and more intense series than the cop shows we've talked about so far on this series, and there's going to be discussion of violence and sexual assault in this episode. Right now, Vic Mackey must look like a mighty big catch to you. Do the smart thing though, son. Cut bait. Doesn't bother you, the things he does. I don't judge other cops. Mackey's not a cop. He's Al Capone with a badge. Vic Mackey is the main character and central anti-hero of The Shields. He's a corrupt cop, using his badge to insert himself into street crime, selling confiscated drugs, and beating the ever-living shit out of suspects. If you take a bird's-eye view of The Shield as one long narrative, you see two different shows. The first half of the series is more focused on policing as an action. The show focuses a lot on the cost-benefit analysis of process and results, something we touched on in great detail in the last episode. This culminates in the fourth season, where the barn's new captain, played by Glenn Close, attacks drug gangs with a hyper-aggressive civil forfeiture policy. Basically, the police seize anything they even suspect to have been purchased with drug money, taking houses and evicting families. It means any property bought with drug money or used to facilitate the drug trade can be seized. That whole storyline of the show is fascinating, but kind of a tangent for what I want to talk about right now. If you guys are really that interested, tell me in the comments and I'll see if I can make a bonus video for it on maybe on Patreon. Maybe, may, you know, maybe if you, you know, become a patron on Patreon and you, you send me a note there, maybe I can, I can, um, I can do it. But I want to focus right now on the back half of the series, from seasons five through seven. They're all about reckoning with the monster we've watched while glued to our television screens. That end game is all about Vic Mackey's soul. Now, usually in this copaganda series, we've looked at systems and how these cop shows portray them, for good or for bad. But with The Shield, I think it's pretty essential to talk about the psychology of a single character, of the show's central, difficult man. I've talked briefly about difficult men on this channel before, in both my videos on Killing Eve and Netflix's You. 
But I think it's important to dive a little more deeply here because of the subject matter. Difficult Men was a term coined by author Brett Martin in his book Difficult Men, colon, behind the scenes of a creative revolution, colon, from The Sopranos and The Wire to Mad Men and Breaking Bad. Brett, my man, chill it with the subtitles. Anyway, Martin outlines the trend of difficult men in 21st century television, how audiences came to root for male protagonists ranging from damaged to anti-heroes to outright villains. He describes this archetype as, quote, a monster, but a person we root for and care for despite his monstrosity. And I think that when this archetype is applied to characters like Vic Mackey and Shane Ventrell, police officers who are supposed to be heroes, the idea of the difficult man takes on a new meaning in the context of the police. We view Vic through a paternalistic lens, seeing him and his goons as our protectors. We don't condone the way they're doing it, but on some level, we feel that it must be done and that this might be the only way to do it. What people want these days is to make it to their cars without getting mugged. If having all those things means some cop roughs up some nigger, some spick in the ghetto, well, as far as most people are concerned, is don't ask, don't tell. It's the same kind of logic that made audiences fall in love with Jack Bauer on 24, a craving for some kind of badge daddy to make the bad guys go away. They might not give a damn about civil or human rights, but they're doing it to protect us from the evil of gang violence. See, but the problem with this is the police aren't a jury of our peers. And again, it's important to point out a racial element. The strike team is white, and nearly all the suspects and criminals on the shield are racial minorities, which gives the whole protecting society from evil idea a bit more of a loaded meaning. This weird melding of difficult men and police is what makes the shield so potent as a piece of police media. It reveals the underlying slack that we're willing to give the police despite their acts of brutality and corruption. With all difficult men, audiences make excuses for the actions of their target anti-heroes, something that probably reached its apex with Dexter. I mean, yeah, he's a serial killer, but he only kills serial killers, so it's fine. That's my review of Dexter. Vic Mackey is no exception. He's trying to create a retirement fund for his family. His kids are autistic and require special attention in special schools. He wants to get drugs and violence off the streets. Well unless he personally has control over them. Now, Vic is not the first difficult police officer in pop culture. In film, this trend is a bit older, epitomized by movies like Dirty Harry and Judge Dredd. Still, even on the small screen, Vic isn't the first difficult police officer. NYPD Blue, one of the most commercially and critically successful TV shows of all time, features Andy Sipowitz, played by Dennis Franz. Sipowitz is a drunk. He's violent, he's bigoted, and just an overall asshole. Hey! Ipsa this, you pissy little bitch. Yet, given the time the show spent on his inner life, presenting all of his flaws in abundant context, audiences loved him. NYPD Blue ran for 261 episodes, ranking in the 20 most viewed programs on TV for each of its first seven seasons. Sipowitz was a pop culture icon, idolized by the likes of George Costanza and Homer Simpson. But Sipowitz does it. If Detective Sipowitz jumped off a cliff, would you do that too? Oh, which I wish I would, Sipowitz. And for this role, Franz won four Emmy Awards for lead actor in a drama, tied for most all time with none other than Brian Cranston's difficult man, Walter White. Sipowitz walked so Vic Mackey could run and go kill people. <laughs> the list of awful things Vic Mackey has done over the course of The Shield is lengthy. The Shield's wiki cites at least a dozen instances of him committing or being an accessory to murder. The incomplete list of tortures and assaults is nearly twice as long and doesn't even include this gem. Smooth's my bitch, which makes you my bottom bitch. Now, I'm not trying to tally up the ledger like this is an episode of The Good Place. We're not adding up all the positive and negative things Vic has done to figure out if he's been a utilitarian asset to society. His actions taint everything he does and everyone around him. And the show goes to great lengths to illustrate this, something we'll discuss in more detail in the next section of this video after I give you a good old spoiler warning. But Jackson, what about criminals? Weren't you just going on about how crime doesn't define a person? Isn't that true for cue ball over here? It'd be one thing if this wasn't a total double standard. Criminals on the shield are treated as inherently villainous or broken, while Vic is afforded over 80 hours of nuance and exploration. He's lining his own pockets and abusing the power society has given him. 
I don't think that the shield is trying to explain away Vic's actions, but to put them into context. And I think that idea is fine on its face. It's just really messed up when the show is contextual and nuanced when it comes to the crooked white cop and that it's black and white with literally everyone else. This is a problem inherent in all difficult men shows. Audiences have often sided with the criminal actions of their main characters and torn down any character who challenges them, despite their actions clearly being wrong. But it hits different when it's the police. We entrust the police to serve and protect society, and Vic isn't doing that. Sure, he does good things. We see him care for a CI and get her off heroin. We see him get semi-automatic guns off the street in a way that gives him no glory or personal profit. The Shield wants us to ask, but at what cost? And I think that's just not the right question. It assumes that the only way to get the good Vic does is to accept the unspeakable evil, that there's no other way. And that's just a false choice. In 1973, one of the leaders of the French New Wave film movement, Francois Truffaut, was asked why there was so little killing in his films. His response? Quote, I find that violence is very ambiguous in movies. For example, some films claim to be anti-war, but I don't think I've ever really seen an anti-war film. Every film about war ends up being pro-war. And I think this is the same struggle The Shield has with portraying a difficult man, a villain, as its main cop. The show might have intended to indict Vic and Shane and the rest of the strike team, but damn do they make those raids look cool. Brett Martin quotes creator Sean Ryan in his book, Difficult Men. Quote, if I said to you, I'm going to have a story about a corrupt cop who murdered another cop and stole a bunch of money, and that there's a pretty virtuous internal affairs detective who starts digging into the case and becomes hell-bent on bringing him to justice, who would be the hero in that piece? Ryan said, referring to the character played by Forrest Whitaker who enters in season five and sets the final downfall of Mackie into motion. But our audience viewed Vic as the hero. They wanted Vic to get away with it. They found every negative thing to say about Whitaker's character they could think of. When we wrote it, I was convinced, boy, we're really gonna make it tough for the audience. They are not going to be sure who to root for. I was an idiot. They knew who to root for. Theoretically, making an anti-hero cop show should have left a black mark on the police. It should show us the capability for monsters in areas of trust. Instead, it backfires. You are my personal hero. Look, you think you're looking at me through some window, when all you're really doing is looking in a mirror. You and I were nothing alike. I would never- Oh, you did! More than once! So, no conversation about The Shield would be complete without breaking down the show's endgame, its closing argument. So, I'm gonna spoil that too. I'm, I know, I'm the worst. I'm gonna spoil the end of The Shield. It's, I'm, I'm so disappointed in myself as a TV critic, but this is what we have to do, okay? If you don't want the end of The Shield spoiled, do not watch this part. If you don't care, then by all means, keep watching. I knew about the ending of The Shield before I watched the show, and it convinced me that I should watch it, so, you know, take that as you will. The final endgame of The Shield begins in earnest in Season 5 when Forrest Whitaker's character starts investigating the strike team. He gets pretty close to breaking them, but Shane ties up a loose end by killing his teammate Lem with a grenade. Lem, I'm sorry, but I had to, right? From there, things start to really fray. Vic finds out, and in the show's best scene, he sees the monster he truly is reflected in Shane. I would have spared Lem. And I stepped up and put Lem down so you could go to bed at night believing that. Shane has a ton of dirt on Vic, so the two start to circle each other. Shane representing the ledger of shit Vic has done, and Vic trying desperately hard to purge it from history. By the series finale, Shane is on the run, and Vic has secured a deal with Ice, giving him full immunity for every terrible thing he's done in exchange for him taking down a Mexican drug cartel. Do you have any idea what you've done to me? I've done worse. With Shane's leverage gone, he and his accomplice wife face prison, with their son growing up in foster care and their daughter being born behind bars. In classic Vic fashion, he pours gasoline on the fire. I'm gonna check in on Jackson and this other kid once a year on their birthdays. I'm gonna tell them some good old stories about Ma and Pa. Must their hair. Take them out for an ice cream. And you don't even get to look at my kids! Shane, faced with his family being ripped apart, poisons his son and pregnant wife before killing himself. It's dark as f and Vic's confessions put his last remaining member of the strike team, Ronnie, 
behind bars. Ronald Everett Gardaki, you're under arrest. For what? The last three years. Vic's family has gone into witness protection to get away from him, and the new job he has with ICE sticks him behind a desk, pulled from the street, writing reports. In the words of critic Alan Sepinwall reviewing the finale in 2008, quote, Vic may not be dead, but he's lost everything and everyone that ever mattered to him. His friends, his family, his reputation. And he may not technically be in jail, but his vengeful new federal boss has constructed his new job like a three-year prison stretch with an ill-fitting suit as his uniform and a barren cubicle as his cell. It's better than Vic deserves, but it leaves us with a more poignant and more depressing message. We'll never be able to fully rid ourselves of the corruption and evil within the police. Even when we're able to definitively prove the strike team was amoral, we're unable to fully remove the tumor. The police banish Vic, but he's not gone. In the final scene of the show, he hears sirens in the distance. And while he can't join them as a cop, he twists his face into a smile, he grabs his gun, and he heads off into the night. That evil within the strike team members was not inherent, or at least wasn't possible, until they acquired power as the strike team. When asked why he embezzled and stole from crime scenes and covered his tracks, Vic tells a lawyer, I'm not gonna use my kids as an excuse, this bull It was easy, all right? I was clearing twice as many cases as anyone here. I worked my ass off. I knew I was making a difference, so I took some from me. Me? The city got their money's worth, trust me. It's power that corrupts the strike team. A total lack of oversight turned into personal profit. And once it starts, that corruption spreads to even the innocent bystanders. Anytime superiors try to rein in Vic and Shane by putting good cops on their squad, those same good cops end up doing no warrant raids in order to fit in. Oh, hell with it. Or they were killed like Terry Crowley. In Shane's suicide note, he spells it out. The guilty ones are me and Vic. Vic led, but I kept following. I don't think one's worse than the other, but we made each other into something worse than our individual selves. I wish I'd never met him. In the words of Sepinwall again, quote, if Shane is a monster, he's a monster that Vic created. And the difference between the two men is a matter of degrees, not kind. I think greed for power is an easy stand-in for Vic here. A craving for domination incarnate. He always needed to be the most macho guy on the street. He needed to manipulate everything from behind the scenes. He needed to control everyone and everything around him. In short, he needed a monopoly on violence. And in a job that inherently holds a monopoly on violence, it's a disturbing message about the possibility or perhaps inevitability of corruption in our police system as it currently exists. All right, so, what do we make of The Shield? Why are so many of us willing to give a pass to Vic Mackey and the crooked cops he represents? After all, power corrupts, so why would the police be any exception? What are you, IED now? I think I've spent more time in 2020 thinking about The Shield than just about any other TV show. And that's not just because of the text of the show, what the show is explicitly saying, but the paradox the show represents. To me, it feels like the creators of The Shield really hate how much they love to hate how much they love cops. I also want to be really upfront about this. It might be really macho and whatever, but I really dig the show. And not just because I'm interested in that internal tension. I started watching the show for this series with a copaganda perspective in mind, and I still thought it was excellent. The show is undeniably interesting in the way it confronts its audience with the potential for horrific acts of brutality that defenders of the police want to ignore. It is absolutely a positive for the show to clearly outline why the blue wall of silence exists, how it persists, and why it's damaging to justice. But at the same time, if you've only seen this video, there's a good chance you're thinking, well, yeah, of course the macho dumb show is copaganda. It glorifies violence. 
It shows hyper-competent police patrolling a thin blue line between the civilized world and an army of people trying to leech off of society, written entirely by middle-aged white dudes. Here's how executive producer Glenn Mazzara put it. Now, do you think the show holds up amid the Black Lives Matter protests? I would say yes and no. I would say yes, it does in the sense that it does show police brutality. It does show cops reveling in their power and getting away with it and no one holding them accountable. We, we had no interest in making our cops heroes. What doesn't hold up is, and we recognized this at the time, that show was written by a group for predominantly of white middle-aged guys. Right. If The Shield was being done today, it would really have to include voices from the communities that are being affected by the police. Even the good cops that are held up in contrast to Vic subscribe to really troubling philosophies about criminals and justice, implying the inherent brokenness or evil of some people in society, that we're just waiting for them to commit crime so we can spot them. Let me get this guy. I want to administer the needle myself. Still, the portrayal of crooked cops on The Shield is pretty unparalleled on TV. Usually crooked cops exist as villains or bad apples that exist for good cops to purge. They're not main characters. But if the LAPD scandals of the 80s and 90s and the police brutality of 2020 have shown us anything, is that this kind of corruption isn't an isolated incident. I don't know, maybe I'm just making this show out to be something that it isn't. Sean Ryan and his team did say that they just wanted to sell Budweiser and deodorant. Maybe the creators didn't really set out to make an anti-cop show, and were just inspired by the inherent drama of police scandals. At the same time, I don't know, there's a lot of depth and commentary here. I mean, who else was talking about civil forfeiture to a national audience in 2006? In some pretty prominent ways though, the Shield fails to critique its main characters in a way that many difficult men shows do, at least for their target audiences. I mean, The Shield is a middle-aged male fantasy, right? A middle-aged man action hero as the strongest, toughest protector of society. There are plenty of comments on YouTube clips of the show saying, Vic is the man, or something to that effect. There's a Reddit thread asking fans when they stopped rooting for Vic, and most of them say some point at the very, very end of the show, rather than the first episode. In some ways, the question The Shield poses to us isn't just about the police, but about the show itself. Is it worth it? In my opinion, an institution that can create a Vic Mackey is not something that should be revered, which I think The Shield would agree with. Both the opening and closing arguments are about the collateral damage of corruption but it also dresses that corruption up in the shape of an action hero. As Truffaut said, it's really hard to make an anti-war film because you end up glorifying it. It's easy to read The Shield charitably in the way that I think I am here, as media that shows us an inevitable product of our police as currently constructed, but it's also equally easy to read it as wish fulfillment, reinforcing really harmful us versus them narratives about police and community. There's no easy answer. I really wish there was. It, it would really be better. It would be better for me. This series would be a, a lot better if there was an easy answer. But I've been thinking about this for like a year and I got nothing. I think the important lesson to be learned here is to hold competing ideas at the same time. Is the shield propaganda? Without a doubt. Is the shield critical of the police? Also definitely true. I think so often in criticisms of these shows, it can be easy to fall into the same black and white worldview that I often criticize TV cops of having. This show good, this show bad. What I think is much more valuable is to examine what ideas are put forward, why, and what that says about us as a society. Whew. Thank you so much for watching. Please share, like, subscribe, do the YouTube things. If you really like the channel and you wanna help this project, hop on over to Patreon. You can get my notes, my addendums to these videos, my other TV reviews, and early access. You can also get my year-end TV rankings and recommendations, which I do a little bit different than a lot of people, but you know, what? I, I think you would like it. Next time, we'll be talking about the most expensive and lucrative TV series of all time, one that just so happens to be about global policing. I am, of course, talking about Captain America in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.